Okay. Um, Sterling is an internationally renowned water media master and author. author. His, his award-winning paintings are in numerous private and corporate collection world, worldwide. Highly respected among his peers, Sterling is often selected to juror re regional, national, and international art competition. As much as sought after international instructor, his workshops are attended by hundreds of artists annually from around the globe with skill levels ranging from novice to professional. His unique and expressive paintings vary, varying in style from abstract expression to traditional. Truly per, per, personified, personified his intuitive sense of color and design. Many of his paintings reinforce his philosophy that less is more and have been affectionate, affect, affectionately described as complex simplicity. Sterling is an author of the best-selling North Light books, Creating Luminous Watercolor Landscapes, a four-step process by W Publishing and is featured artist in numerous other books and publications. He's also the designer of a signature set of mixed media paint brushes and the Sterling Edwards Big Brush Palette, which is used by artists throughout the world. His signature memberships are in 2017 NWS National Watercolor Society, 2015 WPA Whiskey Painters of America, 2010 um, TWSA Transparent Watercolor Society of America, and in 2007 CSPWC Canadian Society of Painters in Watercolor. Have I forgotten any, Sterling? I think you pretty much got it. Okay, good. And I will tell you, if he's not busy, call his wife. She'll book him. <laughs> yeah, right, she'll, be glad, gonna... she'll be glad to. <laughs> now we'll turn it over to Sterling and for his demonstration. I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very glad to be here. And it's been, uh, we've been anticipating this for quite some time. And it's going to be a fun day. What I want to do today, I'm going to do a full sheet watercolor on Fabriano 300 pound cold press paper. Now this is the bright white Fabriano. And uh, I, I want to do a painting, which I'll switch to my table in just a minute, you can see it, but it's, uh, I'm a big fan of the Southwest. And I want to do a painting, which is a stylized interpretation of a couple places I, I visited when I was in, when I was in uh, Canyonlands in Utah. Uh, these are old thousand year old trees, lots of rocks and just really pretty stuff, but they were, they were just screaming to be painted in a very stylized manner. Now by stylized, what I'm referring to is that you, you actually, you can use whatever colors you want. So you're not caught in this local color trap. You can use any color you want to make the painting work. But primarily when I paint something that's stylized, I look, I look at the subject matter and I try to determine what are the main elements of that object or thing, whatever it is. That, that make it so attractive. A lot of times it's just the shapes, the movements, the shadows, it could be a number of things. And in this case, these trees have this very old, beautiful, twisted, windswept look, which I'm gonna try to uh, <clears throat> see if I can't really capture some of that in my painting. So this can be, a, this can be an interesting process. I'm gonna start this to just give you a heads up. I'm gonna do a wet on wet presentation to begin with. So I can get lots of soft edges. Anytime you paint on wet paper with wet paint, you, get all, you automatically get soft edges. And then I will take about a 10 minute break afterwards to dry the paper. And then I'll come in on dry paper and start putting in some hard edges to complement all the soft edges. They'll be very selectively placed to give me a nice balance of hard and soft edges. There'll be light and dark values, warm and cool colors. Uh, it's what I refer to as my rule of opposites. So I'm gonna really try to employ that in this painting so that everything in the painting is complemented somewhere in that painting by its opposite. It doesn't have to be a one-for-one -one trade off. I might have 10 negative shapes and just one positive shape, but they, they complement each other. So I'm gonna switch to my other camera real quickly. So bear with me one second and we'll get this thing started. Okay, this is my drawing table and I've got a couple of photographs here uh, of rock formations and trees that I took when I was in Canyonlands. And the reason I've got two photographs, these are both taken the same day, just one, I think mean, this was taken later in the afternoon, it wasn't quite as bright, you see more color, but these rock formations and these old, and these old trees are so beautiful, they just have so much uh, charm and so much movement to them. I love that tree right there, but I like these rocks right here. So I'm going to take this tree and put it on these rocks. 
And that's just uh, taking some artistic license. But I do this quite a bit. It's all about the painting. It's not about the photograph. It's about what inspires you as an artist. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to lay those photographs right there. And here I just did a real quick sketch on the drawing pad. And I did take a, a, a Sharpie and kind of draw my design so you can see it better. I, I started out doing it in pencil, but it was very hard to see. And I know when you're looking through a camera, it's difficult. But here's, here are the big rocks down here. I got this big twisted gnarly tree coming up like this and all the, all the greenery on it and everything. And I want to do this in a very stylized, quote, semi-abstract manner uh, using whatever color I feel like using. I'm going I'm to use some different colors in this piece. Nothing too off the, off the charts, but just, uh, just to make the piece more enticing. My center of interest is going to be right here. Uh, I believe in the rule of thirds. This third right here is my center of interest. You got rocks, you'll have tree roots, you got some grass, uh, you'll have the, the trunk of the tree coming down. Just everything kind of culminates right in this area. So I'm gonna really play that up as a center of interest. All these areas out here, we'll do just enough that they become part of the painting, but I'm gonna focus most of my attention in this area. So that's, that's my plan. I'm, I'm a firm believer in always have a workable plan before you wet that piece of paper. So I'm gonna get these out of the way very quickly and work on a quick sketch. And I'm just using, this is just a soft pencil. It's probably like a B or something. I'm not sure, it's just a, one of these mechanical pencils. It's got a big lead in it. And I'm drawing this fairly dark so you can really see it. So this is that big tree coming out like this. And of course it's got all kinds of a penny just coming off of it, branches and what have you. It goes up like this. There's also a part that goes like that. So I'm not doing a whole lot of drawing. I'm just kind of showing basically where the tree is, how the roots look, where the trunk of the tree is. And there's some big rocks. Some of these rocks are more squared off than others. So I'm just kind of showing these overlapping rocks. I'm trying to vary the size of them. Just like this, nothing too fancy. You notice I'm not, I'm not knuckling down going like this. I'm just, I'm getting the whole arm going. I want these nice fluid pencil lines. And then of course up here, there's all the, uh, all the beautiful greenery on the tree and everything. So this is about as much drawing as I typically do in a piece. There's just no reason to sit down and draw too much because everything I need to make this painting work is right here. I know where the tree goes. I've got the movement. I've got a few branches. I've got some of these overlapping rocks. There's also some grass down in this area. I'll probably put some of that in there. More little rocks. And this area right here, like I said, will be my center of interest. So let me get the sketch out of my way. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do right now to begin this piece, I'm, I'm going to get some color mixed up. And I want the color mixed up before I wet my paper, because once you wet that paper, you've got a limited amount of time to work before it dries. So you're better off to go ahead and get as much color mixed as you can uh, while the paper is wet. So for the, 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 all the foliage up here, I'm, I'm taking some cad yellow. I'm putting some burnt sienna with it. And I'm also putting some ultramarine blue. I get this nice, beautiful kind of a muted green. And I can make that just as bright as I want, depending on how much that cadmium yellow I put in. I can also take permanent yellow, which is a much darker yellow. It's kind of like an Indian yellow. I can take that. I can also mix some ultramarine with that. It's a much, it's a much darker, more of an earthy tone, which I like. And I can make that as a, you know, so I'm mixing quite a lot of paint. I'm, I'm making some pretty big puddles. This, that's a big piece of paper. This is a full sheet, 22 by 30 inch piece of paper. So I need a lot of paint to cover it. For the rocks, I'm taking some burnt sienna. I'm just mixing just various color mixes over here. This is burnt sienna. And I'm putting a color called bright rose. Bright rose is almost like opera. It's not quite as intense as opera, but it's a very, very, uh, very bright, cool pink color. It makes it a wonderful color for rocks. I can also take some umber and some bright rose, have a little different color. And here I'm mixing a little bit of violet. The reason I'm doing is I, I want to have these colors pre-mixed before I wet my paper. So I can just go right into the paint to the paper without having to stop and continually mix new paint. I, I will at some point mix new paint as I go, but primarily I'm just trying to uh, give myself every fighting chance I have to get this piece done in the allotted time we have. So that's as much Excuse as I need. That's enough to get started. Yes. 
Sterling, uh, this is Susan. Uh, we're looking at your palette right now and it's unusual. I haven't seen that uh, style before. Could you talk about it? Yeah, I designed this about 10 years ago. It's, it's a Sterling Edwards big brush palette and it actually accommodates, that's a two inch brush. It accommodates big brushes. And so you've got 14 small wells, each are whole bind paint, just a nice variety of whole bind. And then you've got these interior wells, which are slanted that you can use to have colors pre-mix. You have these nice little wells of color that are wet and ready to go. And they're separated from your main mixing area. And it's just, a, a, I always try to find a palette that accommodate big brushes and I couldn't find one, so I designed one. And then I had it, uh, had it manufactured, but it's, uh, it's available in a lot of our supply stores. They, they sell them, I think, at uh, Cheap Joe's and Jerry's. I think Dick Flick sells them. Uh, it's, it's Is it porcelain? Quite... Oh, no, it, it's not. It's just a heavy duty plastic. It's heavier than most plastic pallets. It's, it's a pretty heavy duty yeah. plastic. All right, thank you. And then what someone's asking, what are you blotting your, it looks like a big roll of toilet paper or oh, something. <laughs> that is, that's, that's toilet paper. There and, you I, go. I, and I wrap paper towel around it. That's, a, that's the best tool you'll ever have right there. That will save more paintings than anything else. Because that's how I control the water in my brush. So I, I, I've minimized my risk of getting blossoms and backgrounds. Now I'm just spraying this paper with this clear water. And I'm also going to take this big, this is a very stiff hog bristle brush. This is a brush I designed, it's very stiff. I'm going to take that brush and use that just to move that water around and make sure that paper is totally covered. And when you start wet on wet, if you use a piece of 300 pound paper, it's much easier, especially a big piece, it's much easier to work on 300 than it is on 140 because 140 buckles, but also, uh, 140 can only hold a small amount of water. This paper is so thick, it, it sucks a lot of water up, which gives me much more time to block in my initial washes before it starts drying on me. I want this paper totally saturated. Let's put a bit more on there just to make sure we got enough. So you see now why I had to get those colors pretty mixed because I didn't want to be doing you know, uh, get this paper nice and wet and spend five minutes mixing color because every minute I spend over here, this paper is getting drier. I want that paper saturated and I want my color ready to go. So I just dive right into it. So let's see what, what we can do. Let's take some of this, uh, this look, just a little bit of uh, Prussian blue, just a touch. I want just a little I mean, bit this of This is right. Gloria. Sure. Do you ever wet the back of that paper? Uh, no, I don't. The I, just, I, I tape it out. I, I tape it down with masking tape, and I, all I do is wet the front. Now, a lot Thank of artists do wet the back. I, I personally don't. I just take it out of the box and tape it down. I'm ready to go. And uh, I know there's, I have no objection to people wetting both sides. It's just something I never do. So I'm laying just a very light wash of some uh, Prussian blue. Now, let's see if we can get some of this greenery in here. This is the so there's gonna be a lot of uh, a lot of green in the tops of these trees. That's a cadmium yellow with a little bit of the ultramarine blue mixed with it, and I'm trying to vary so some little bit some little bit more blue than other areas. What was and the I, blue that you used? Uh, this this that was a uh, that's Prussian blue right in here, but now this I'm using uh, ultramarine blue with this. This is a uh, ultramarine blue and cadmium yellow. This gives me just a really nice pretty. Uh, pretty kind of a, a earthy green that's got a little bit of brightness to it. Now down in here, there's some grass. Real quickly before everything gets too dry, but I'm gonna put some uh, quinacridone gold right down in here. And we're gonna make that look like grass later on. Uh, I'll put a little bit of umber with that. So it's all, right now, it's all about just getting interesting colors, interesting textures, and not getting too caught up in all the little uh, fine nuances that that we all have a tendency to do sometimes. We, you know, sometimes we'll work on a piece, we'll just get too way too carried away with uh, trying to make everything look just perfect. But for example, right in here, I'm putting in some, this is umber, a little bit of ultramarine blue. I'm gonna do the trunk of the tree and I'm putting some burnt sienna with that. So it's all about just getting these nice, beautiful sweeping brush strokes. This is what I call the block in phase. We're blocking in the painting. Uh, we'll get into the actual painting on dry paper, but first you got to get it blocked in. So that's what we're doing right now. And I'm leaving a lot of white right in this area, a lot of white paper. I 
And now I can start working on some of these rocks. Now these are the actual colors of the rocks. I'm using this, uh, this little bit of burnt sienna, a little bit of umber, and some of that bright rose, that's that pink color. And again, we're leaving a lot of white, a lot of white paper. White paper is great stuff. It's something a lot of us forget to do. We forget to leave that white. I'm a real stickler about that. I, I'm a firm believer that the more white paper you leave in a piece, quite often the prettier it is because that white paper gives it a sparkle. Now, one thing I do want to do right now, I'm going to take another one of these bristle brushes. This is, a, this is an inch and a half. I'm going to get it wet. And I'm squeezing most of the water out with a tissue. So it's just a Kleenex. I just come, so I can come in and soften some edges now. It's a very, very stiff little brush. So we got some pretty color going now. Let's just see how far we can push this. Let's put a little bit of violet in some of this, in some of these rocky areas. That's a little bit of violet, a little bit of burnt sienna mixed with it. Now we're starting to get some actual definition of some of these rocks. But I'm not really trying to paint a rock as much as I'm just trying to create shapes that people can interpret as rocks. And I can also get some more of that pretty uh, green color up in this area. So when you work on a piece like this, uh, you just have to get in there and just book it. You can't get too passive without it because like I said, every minute that I've spent trying to figure out what I'm gonna do, that paper's getting drier by the second. I wanna get in there and just, just kind of get things rocking a little bit. This is ultramarine and cadmium yellow, getting some beautiful greens now. Now in a few minutes, I'm gonna switch brushes. I'm gonna get into the, uh, my one inch flat brush. That's a flat nylon brush. I have a little bit more control over the shapes by doing that than I do with this big brush. But it's nice to have this big brush available just to do all this, this uh, initial block in like I'm doing right now. And of course you see these areas of white, very, very important. I'm gonna put just a little bit of Payne's gray in that, just in those rocks, just to make them just a touch darker. What really attracted me to this whole area was the, the beautiful uh, sculpted look of the rocks, the, these, these very uh, almost artistic looking trees with all the beautiful uh, movement they had in addition to the color. So I'm trying to really take what first attract me to this area and include that in my painting. So instead of just trying to do a, a, a typical piece where I just paint uh, everything as it is, I'm kind, of a, I'm kind of exaggerating some of the shapes and some of the colors to make it kind of suit uh, my feeling about the piece when I saw it. I'm gonna take some of that color and put it right up in here. That's that same color I use in this area for the rocks. I'm putting some up here in the tree. Now we're getting all kinds of pretty movement. You see that tree kind of twisting and gnarling. It's just these things have been swept around for a couple thousand years. Some of these trees are very, very old. And it's really kind of fun just get in there and kind of play with this and just see if I can really try to capture some of that pretty movement.
I'm gonna switch brushes now and get my one inch flat. Now this is a this is a soft one inch flat nylon brush. It's got a very nice sharp little edge on it. The paper is still fairly wet. So anything I put down here right now is gonna still have a little bit of a softness to it, which is nice. So I can put a little bit of color where some of this grass is. That's a little bit of quinacridone gold, actually. I'm putting some yellow with it. I want this, uh, remember, it's all about color at this stage of the game. We're really trying to get some pretty color going here. All right, now I'm gonna take some, I start working some darker dye. This is my, my violet, this is permanent violet. I'm trying to really see if I can't uh, get some interesting movement going up that tree. And like I said, I'm working fast, but in a few minutes, I will have to stop and dry this. You, you reach a point after a while where it's almost too wet to continue. You just gotta just stop and turn the dryer on and get, uh, get back into some nice, so you get back into some nice drier paper. But as long as that paper's wet, get as much done as you can while you can. I'm gonna take some more of that ultramarine blue and put that in some of these rocks. And so that ultramarine is such a beautiful, beautiful, strong color. Now we start working on some individual branches, kind of showing how this uh, this tree is all, everything kind of just works in harmony. They all kind of just morphs into this beautiful wavy little tree. Be a lot of negative shapes. Sterling, Susan's asking if you are using your reference photo if, or if you're making this up. Uh, this is it's about half and half. I use a reference photo just to do my initial sketch on that piece of paper. But what I'm doing right now is, you know, after a while you get to a point where it's no longer about the photograph, it's all about the painting. Because when you get to this stage, uh, there's no reason to sit there and get too caught up and try and make everything look just perfect because it is a, a very stylized looking piece. So I'm taking what I have and say, so I could put a little bit more shape here. I could do some more dark over there. There's all kinds of things I can do at this stage of the game to really kind of uh, make this painting come together. So if it needs more dark, uh, I have the option of putting in more dark or I can just leave it like it is, or I can, if I need more shapes, I can cut into the shapes I have and start making some more negative shapes. Uh, there, there's just no limit to what you can do with these things at this stage. So I'm trying to really, uh, look at this piece with a with a fresh eye because i've never painted this I've, I've painted a couple of these paints but i've never done this particular one so it's uh this can be an exciting thing for me to do because i'll be just surprise everybody else is what it winds up being but i know the process works and that's the main thing i look for if the process works nine out of ten times the painting is going to work and this is uh this is this is pretty much the way i i do most of my pieces i put in uh, major competitions and shows they all start out just like this using a photograph just as an idea, and then saying, what can I do to take that idea and kind of crank it up a notch or two? It looks fantastic. So she also is asking what to do if she's, if you use 140 pound instead of the 300 pound paper. 
if I were doing this on 140, I would do it much smaller. Because uh, you notice I'm doing a lot of work on this wet paper. And then this is, uh, it's very hard to do on 140 pounds. It dries real quickly. So if I were to do this on 140, I'd probably be doing a half sheet instead of a, instead of a full sheet. But you, you notice how much time I've had to go in there and work on some of this. Now these rocks, there's a big rock right there where we haven't finished yet. We're not going to until later. But uh, everything right now has a, 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 pretty, a pretty soft edge on it. And that's all by design. That's the reason I start on wet paper most of the time. I want that softness because that gives me a chance to uh, come in later on with some hard edges, which were, were pretty balanced for all the soft edges. And I didn't used to always paint this way. I was a photorealist for uh, about 25 years. I would, I would paint every blade of grass in a 60 acre field. And I finally just got too burned out doing that. I, I couldn't do it anymore. I had to find a better, uh, more exciting way to paint. And that's when I started doing these, uh, these very stylized pieces using predominantly large brushes. Now I'm getting some dry brush right in here. There's a little bit of dry brush. Dry brush is beautiful. Uh, dry brush is also a warning. That means the paper is getting dry on the surface, which means I got to, uh, in just a second, I got to, got to stop and dry this. When you start getting dry brush, that means the surface is dry, but that's also a trap because we start thinking it's dry, then we put a wet brush and there goes a big blossom. The paper is not dry, it's just dry on the surface. There's still lots of water just below the surface. So I've been looking for that dry brush and that's usually the, the, uh, the cue that I need to know that it's time to uh, just get out and dry the paper. So let me get a couple more minutes here, then we'll, we'll turn that dryer on and then we'll you know, take a little bit of a break while I, while I dry the paper. And then someone asked about your palette that the paint isn't beat, doesn't seem to beat up on it. Did you do something to prepare you know, actually, it? Actually, when you, when you first, most, most plastic palettes when you first buy them, they're pretty slick. They're, they're, they're made in a mold. They're injected into a mold and the mold is very slick. Now, what you can do sometimes is you can, uh, you can take a magic eraser and just take it to the kitchen sink and just scrub it really good with a magic eraser and that'll kind of rough it up a little bit. Uh, something else you can do is you can take vinegar, uh, just plain white vinegar, and um, uh, take a sponge full of white vinegar and just scrub it down really well, and then uh, rinse it off really well, then, then let that dry, then put your paint in it then. The vinegar is acidic enough, it, it will sometimes kind of eat away at the texture just a little bit. You don't want to lose all that pretty uh, uh, shine, but, you know, but it, it can be aggravating. I've had so many pals in the past that just... Uh, uh, it just drove me up a wall until I finally figured out that there are ways to go in there and manipulate that just a little bit, or rough it up just enough that it will accept the paint. That's probably a good place to stop and dry the paper. So we got a lot done just on wet paper. All these colors, we're going to be doing a lot of work on this. We're going to come back in and we're going to start adding more negative shades. We're going to do more down in here. Remember, this is my center of interest. So most of the work is gonna be done in this area. This area, I'm gonna leave a lot of these areas pretty soft. I'll, I'll put some more branches and darks. But this area right in here is where I'm trying to pull the viewer. And uh, it's very important that I leave that as a, as a fairly light area right through here. That's where all the grass is and the weeds and the rocks and the tree, it all kind of culminates in this spot. So, and, and I have to force myself to do this because it's very tempting to get up here and start trying to detail all this. Detailing all this is not going to make the painting better. It's going to make it worse, in my opinion, because it's going, to, it's going to draw the eye away from this up into that area. So I want to put just enough up in these areas that it becomes part of the painting, but it doesn't try to steal the show. That's the star of the show right there. These are all supporting actors. Supporting actors should never get more spotlight than the stars. So I have to remind myself sometimes, who's the star? Well, that's the star right there. That's why I'm leaving these areas of white paper. It's so... It's so pretty, that it'll white against these darks, and there'll be much more darks as I get further into it. So this is a good place for me to uh, turn on my dryer and dry this real quick. Now, if anybody has any questions before I do that, please don't hesitate to, to speak up. I did have a request to see the, um, your reference photos one more time, if yeah. you have a minute. Thank okay. you. This, that's the photograph of the tree. Now, you notice I embellish it to make it a little bit more green than it is, but I use that just as a starting point. And here's a photograph of the rocks. See the rocks are all just piled up and these rocks are much more almost geometric compared to these rocks, which are more rounded. 
I wanted the geometric rocks because this tree has so much uh, curv curvilinear design to it, all these wavy lines. I needed something really solid like, solid like these rocks to kind of anchor it down. So I'm taking the rocks in this photograph and putting them with the tree on this photograph. Great, thank you. Well, I do this a lot. Uh, quite often I will take a piece and uh, I might find a tree I like in this photograph and an old building in this photograph and maybe a, uh, a big cloud formation in this photograph. I'll just do a few sketches and put them all together. And I think those are really some of my better pieces because I'm not trying to copy a photograph per se. I'm just taking different elements of photographs and building my own little private world out of it. And by doing that, I'm able to, uh, I think, do something that's much more, and more, much more exciting to look at. Now, one thing I'm going to suggest to you, all of you, um, and I'll leave this up to, uh, to Vicki and, and Susan, but the, the problem with webcams, sometimes the color you see on your camera is not exactly the color on my painting. Webcams that have not been perfected yet, and the color is not as good as it should be. When I finish this piece, I will take a photograph of the finished painting, and uh, I will send that to Susan, if that's okay, Susan, I will send that to you. And if you want to just uh, forward it to everybody else that took the class or, or took the demo, uh, you can certainly do that. That way they can really see more true to life what my colors look like in this painting. Because it's, uh, I'm looking at my computer, I'm looking at my computer screen and the colors I'm seeing in my light in here uh, don't look quite as uh, pretty as the colors in the actual painting. So I will be glad to, uh, I do that for all my Zoom classes too. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, if anybody has any more questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Otherwise, I'm gonna turn this dryer off about, let's give me about 10 minutes. It won't take too long. I'm going to dry this thoroughly. Then I'm going to come back in on dry paper. And then we're going to really go to town on this piece and see what we can do with it. Perfect. Okay. I'll turn my, I'm going to put myself on mute while I'm drying this. So it doesn't, uh, doesn't blow right. my eardrums out. That's good. And then, uh, uh, Sterling, when you come back uh, or somewhere towards the end, if you'll just um, talk about the workshop and what we're going to be doing in it. Absolutely. Be glad yeah. to. Thank you. Okay. okay, if anybody has any fun jokes while we're waiting for him to dry it, now's the time. <laughs> I, I did. Hi, I did have a question and I and you're going to address it if um, like he's going to do a city scene or a natural scene like rocks and trees for the workshop. So um, that'd be great if we could find that out. Because we're drawing our own picture, but we don't know. Should we draw a flower? Should we draw a tree or a yeah, city? We'll address that at, at uh, later on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And there's still time to sign up for the workshop. It starts tomorrow it's for three days. So if anybody is loving what they're seeing, which I am, uh, you can still sign up. There's some, there's spots open. So consider it. Susan, this is Chris, Chris Oliver. Yep. I think I'm going to sign up tonight. So, okay. That sounds good. But just to let you know. Okay. And I'll be jumping in and out and hopefully watching it in the evening. So thank you. So one of the things, if you are going to take the workshop, and I think Vicki just put it in the, uh, the chat, is if you have 300 pound paper, uh, his style is, seems to be, the 300 pound seems to be beneficial um, to use for his method. And you can use 140 as he said, but uh, you would probably want to use it in a smaller version. So you can do it. So maybe like a quarter sheet or something like that. And as he said, he's right currently he's painting on a full sheet um, of 300 pounds. So just make a note of that. Also, the 300 pound with a lot of water doesn't buckle the way some of the 140 pound papers do.
Susan, do you remember? Did he say he has toilet paper under his paper towels? Is that what I think he has? I think he has toilet paper on top of his paper towels. Oh, okay. I, I got it. Actually, okay. I watched one of his demo, one of his other demos, and what it sounded like is he has a toilet paper roll that's always the same, and he puts a paper towel over the top of it. it it's what he said in another class, but if he could uh, clarify that, that'd be great. Yeah, I heard that too. Debbie, were you going to say something? Mm, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to know about that. He's also very, he uses a lot of his bristle brushes, uh, which he designed again. And um, I haven't used that very often. I don't know if you, uh, of the others, so if you all have, um, it's a very stiff brush, but um, he designed them specifically for his methods, and you can also buy those online as well. He also has his own paints too, I saw. Yeah. He has his own paints and brushes. They're all on his website. Whose birds are we hearing? That's really nice. <laughs> Probably mine. I'm I'm in my garage studio and I have the thing open because it's such a beautiful day. <laughs> it's like early spring. The birds are <laughs> chirping. Yeah, exactly. Oh boy. Yeah, when I mute, you won't hear them anymore. Unless you unless you do oh, it. Darn. <laughs> Well, the, the challenge, the Instagram challenge for March is wing it. So all you bird lovers Ooh. out there. Yeah. Okay, this is nice and dry. All now, right. like I said, when you when you work on wet paper, you do at some point have to stop and dry it. Otherwise, you can put a wet brush on there and get a big blossom. Right now, there's not a blossom anywhere because I started out with very wet paper and very wet paint. And as the paper started to dry, I'd, I'd use drier brushes and drier paint. I, I use that to control the water in that brush. I could still mix up a nice wet mix, but before I put it on my paper, I would go like that just to blot the excess water out to the brush. And by doing that, you do eliminate a lot of these annoying uh, back runs and blossoms. Now, one thing I want to do, now that this is dry, I can come in and draw a little bit more on this the big rock right there. I'm bringing this rock higher than these. These were exactly the same height, and I didn't catch that when I first did it, but I can catch it now. So I'm just trying to bring this up a little bit higher on this side so it's not too symmetrical with the other side. The other thing is there's a lot of tree roots coming down. The tree roots come down like this and they, they branch off this big tree. And of course they, they branch out everywhere. They're, they're, it's a pretty big tree. So I'm just suggesting where some of those tree roots are gonna be. And the rest is all gonna be done just kind of, uh, uh, kind of winging it as I call it. If it needs something, I'll put it in. If it doesn't, I won't because I'm no longer, in fact, I don't even need, there's my photographs. I'm getting rid of those. I'm putting them over here, which I do that a lot because otherwise, uh, either consciously or subconsciously, I'll find myself trying to copy that photograph. And the photograph has done its job. It gave me an idea for a painting. So everything I do from this point on is going to be uh, pretty much intuitive. If it needs more dark, I'll add dark. If it needs some shapes, I'll add some shapes. But otherwise, we're going to just kind of let it uh, let the piece evolve on its own. Now, I'm going to start in my center of interest right in here. This is a mix of uh, Payne's Gray and Burnt Sienna. I'm going to start putting in a few of these negative roots that are coming off that big tree. And I got a little small blending brush. It's a little brush I use just to come in and soften some edges with. So it gets that nice movement down in this area as well. It's not just, it's not all this and that area. I've also brought some that, that, uh, that, that pretty movement down into this area.
I'm using a little small brush just to soften it. That's barely damp. A little bristle brush. I'm using that just to soften it, an occasional edge. So I put it, I put some color in and I come in quickly and soften the edge I don't need or don't want. Now we're starting to really tie that tree down to that, that big rock formation. All these little roots are just, <clears throat> it's almost like they're grabbing hold of that. The tree is grabbing hold of these rocks to hold it up. Sterling, this is Vicki. Um, Reba's asking, do you ever do a value study or do you go straight to sketching and painting? Uh, sometimes I'll do a value study. In fact, in a workshop, quite often I will do a, a value study of at least one of the pieces during the week because it gives people a chance to see how I do them. When I do the value studies, you know, you can do them with pencil or you can do them with a brush. I like to do them with a brush uh, for the simple reason that once you've done that value study, you, you know you can paint the piece because you just did. The only difference between the value study and the actual painting is the, the painting has more color. The value study is pretty monochromatic. So I, uh, so quite often I will uh, do a value study in a workshop just to show people how I go about doing them. I think they're great. I don't do as many as I used to, uh, but, I, but I do uh, stress sometimes teaching value studies. So that's getting a lot of a lot of definition down this area now, which is like I said, that's my center of interest. I'm really trying hard not to lose all these little white areas. These little white areas are they're very important. That's what gives the painting all of its uh, its sparkle. Now here's a big rock back here. Let's see if we can't. There's also some grass. I'm just giving that kind of a grassy texture. So a stylized piece like this, it's just, it's very suggestive. You, you give the viewer just enough to make a decision what something is, but you don't give them everything. Let them figure it out. Uh, people are good at doing that. If you just suggest it, they'll see it. Now work on some of these rocks, make them look a little bit more craggy. So I put a little bit of color down and I come in quickly and soften an edge if I don't need it. Uh, cast that edge while it's wet. And there's more of the roots. These roots really starting to put on quite a shed. I have not put a whole lot of really strong dark in this piece. I will. These are pretty much dark mid-tones for the most part. Uh, towards the end of this piece, I will come in and put some very, very strong darks in it. And that's going to really be the uh, what I think is the crowning touch quite often. But I've just learned from experience, don't go too dark too quickly. you got a lot of time to put the darks in later. Don't get too, uh, don't get too heavy handed with it at this stage.
That area is getting kind of wet. So let's back away from that and work on this a little bit. Now we're back over here working on the rocks again. And that's pretty much what I generally do. I work on areas that start getting saturated, then I'll, then I'll move on and work on something else. And that way, by doing that, I kind of eliminate the, uh, the risk of getting, uh, again, too many blossoms or back runs. I'd like to avoid those whenever I can. And one of the best ways to do it is just knowing when an area is getting pretty wet. If it's getting too wet, you can always just come back and paint it later, but stay out of it for right now. And again, this is just Payne's gray, a little bit of that bright rose, which is that kind of a, a little bit of a hot pink color. And then uh, some of the Payne's gray, but look how it makes these rocks really pop out. So I'm looking at the, the planes in the rocks, the various flat areas of the rocks, and just trying to decide where, where could I put a little bit more, uh, a little more value in there to make it kind of read as a rock without getting too, uh, too overly picky. So uh, those of you who are taking the workshop this week, I'm assuming there's probably some of you watching this demo, but uh, you're going to see a lot of stuff this week about negative painting, uh, how to look at designs, take a photograph that has a nice interesting design and kind of extrapolate on that and uh, embellish it. And that's really what this whole workshop is about. It's all about creating a very exciting stylized piece of art. Stylized, of course, meaning something that's uh, well, on the semi-abstracted side. Sterling, this is Vicki. Um, yes. Jane is asking, has the direction of sun or light been determined? Not on this piece it hasn't, because I don't, sometimes I don't do a lot of light direction on pieces like this, because they're, they're more about just shapes and colors. But if I were to guess, I would say it's coming in like that. Uh, that's one of those things that you really kind of want to decide before you start the piece, that way you know where to leave your, uh, your, your sunlight area, your, your highlighted area. Uh, in a piece like this, I see more light hitting this than I do on this side. So you can almost you can imagine it's coming like this. But, but the problem you get into if you do a piece like this is once you start getting too much into that light, then you've also got to get into the shadows. And when you start putting shadows, and like that, that tree is casting shadows all down here, it just uh, it's, it, it can almost be too much. This is such a very stylized painting. The uh, the the light source is not a is not going to make a big difference the way the overall painting looks at this stage, done in this style. Now, if I were doing this as a more uh, representational piece, and of course, I would definitely be uh, putting in the shadows and focusing on a lot of the light source. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, one of the hardest problems you have when you paint like this is not getting too realistic. Keep it, keep it all in that, uh, that very almost a fantasy world kind of a look, because that's pretty much what it is. It's just a very... Uh, it just has a very unusual quality to it. Now we're gonna come in at the very end and glaze some color. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave this area alone for a while and start working up here because this tree has all kinds of beautiful gnarly bark. Sterling, this is Susan. Have you always painted in this, um, you know, the way you're painting now or? Oh no, uh, no I didn't. I, I was a, uh, for about 25 years, I was a photorealist. I would spend sometimes two or three months on the painting. And yeah. uh, I just I just got totally burned out. I couldn't do that anymore. It, it was so it was so monotonous. I just had to find something else. I had to find a better way to paint because I, I just got to where I didn't want to paint. Uh, I was yeah. spending so much time just sitting there painting little blades of grass and little leaves. And I said, I just I gotta find something more exciting than this. And uh, I was very fortunate. I, I took many, many years studying with Zoltan Zeba. He was my primary mentor and he taught me basically how to how to see things more as the shapes and colors and designs and not so much detail because detail is pretty but it it has its place it's not everything and a lot of people think it is but you know if you have a nice composition and you know you uh use expressive colors you can you can take anything and make the painting out of it it doesn't have to be yeah. something attractive 
because it's all about his shapes, take, shapes and colors. Yeah, and, and I think that's uh, an issue that a lot of artists fall into the the detail. How long did it take you to to you know make your transition to fully to this? Because I mean, it's beautiful. Well, I appreciate that. It, it it took several years, but I but I was also I had a career at the time, so I couldn't dedicate a lot of time to it. I just I kind of took it in steps. But it was a it was definitely a, a learning process, and I had to just force yeah. myself to to do it. But like I said, I my first inclination often was to get in there and try to detail it because that's what I've been doing for so many years. And I finally realized mm -hmm. that then the detail does not make the painting. Detail is beautiful. I'm not knocking detail. People that do detailed work are very skilled craftsmen. I appreciate that. You know this this is a crafty way of painting too, but it's just a little bit more expressive because. Uh, if you think about it, if you walk in an art gallery or even a home and there's a painting on the wall, if you're standing 10 feet away from that piece, you really don't see the detail. You see the shapes and the colors and the values. And if, you, if you'll if you focus most of your attention on those factors, then you come at the very end and pop just a little bit of detail and you've pretty much got a finished painting. So the, you know, so the, so the detail is not always, uh, detail is nice, but it's not always necessary to have a lot of detail in a piece. Right. And then the negative painting aspect of it, do you find um, students struggle with negative painting? Oh yeah, they, they do a lot. And uh, I, yeah. I like to, uh, in, in fact, when my workshop, I show people some exercises you can do to really master negative painting quickly. And there, there's, okay. there's, uh, there's some things you can, I, I can teach that are really, uh, they're really good. I've been teaching it for years and I've seen some people that uh, swore they could never do it, uh, do some pretty incredible stuff. Is that something you're going to cover in the workshop? Oh yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll spend one afternoon, okay. or even maybe even one morning, just showing people that exercise. It's a very yeah. simple exercise, but it's a very effective exercise. Okay, good. So that's I mean, exciting. I, know I struggle with it, so I'm sure others do too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, this is beautiful, and what I'm seeing, I, I, I can't wrap my head around how you're creating this. Like, what are you seeing that I can't see? Does that I'm make sense? Yeah, I'm seeing an opportunity to make shapes. All this pretty stuff up here. We know this is this is uh, this is a juniper of some type, but we know these are pine needles and stuff. But what I'm looking for is just how to get just a nice, pretty, uh, just a suggestion of branches kind of going up into it. It'd be a branch or two coming down here at the end, and this, for example, this is a little branch coming off right here. Maybe it goes up like this, and you know, it just kind of turns into something else. So I'm putting just enough of a little suggestion that you see that it comes up and it kind of just disappears. It disappears into all that stuff. Now I'm gonna put some more color in these uh, upper areas in just a minute. In fact, I might put some right in here, like right now, like in this area. That's just using my one inch flat. Hey, and I'm putting, hey. that's, just, that's just a little bit of burnt sienna and permanent yellow and a little bit of uh, ultramarine. And your painting is, uh, the paper's completely dry right now, right? You didn't spray it again in an oh, area. No, this, this, this is all dry paper. The only thing that's wet are the areas where I've kind of worked on a little bit and I'm trying my best to kind of stay out of those if they, if they get too wet. So see, we're putting just enough up in here, then kind of softening an edge. You get this nice edge. That edge says these are pine needles. There's no reason to get in there and start picking away at it, painting individual pine needles, because it's not important. Uh, people know that's some kind of a uh, evergreen or a pine tree or juniper or something, just like down in here. That's just enough that tells people what it is, but it's not too much, and it has some pretty brushwork. And, uh, and that's one of the hardest things I had to learn was just don't give the viewer everything. Give them just enough to make a decision. And uh, they'll, like I said, they'll usually figure it out. So that's just enough on that edge. You know, that's some kind of a, some kind of an evergreen or juniper or something. But it has these nice, uh, these, these nice brushy strokes coming down. But years ago, if you were watching me paint this 40 years ago, I'd, I'd have a two hair brush making, making every little pine needle. Uh, fortunately, I finally, uh, made the decision to get away from that because I just it just it was just a very very tedious way of painting I respect those that do it but personally I just had to uh I had to hang it up it was just it was too demanding and I just and I really did get the point I didn't want to paint because it was just I was sitting there for hours and hours and days and weeks just painting little pine needles and blades of grass and I just uh, I said there's gotta be a better way to do this that's when I started shopping around for somebody to show me well, as you said, he, Zoltan is the master. He, uh, you know, he did it. He's got some incredible books out too. Uh, and I've only recently discovered them. And then when I saw your stuff, uh, it's very reminiscent of it. You both are 
you know, do the negative painting so, you know, beautifully. Well, I appreciate it. He's, he's one that taught me how to do it. And uh, it, it's right now, negative painting is kind of the backbone of my style of painting. Yeah. And that, and that is very heavily influenced by what I learned from, uh, from him. And he, he was a master, no question about it. He was a, yeah. uh, he was a, he was a true master artist. So on that note, Marion's asking, how many workshops did you take from Zoltan? I took 16. And, I did 16. Really? Yep. Wow. And do you have a favorite book of his or a book of another painter or artist that's a favorite? Yeah, there's a book that Zoltan wrote. In fact, it just came out again as a reprint. He died about almost 20 years ago. And uh, yeah. but there's a book that's called Zoltan Zabo's 70 Favorite Watercolor Techniques. And it's, uh, it's he, awesome. he shows how to, he shows how to paint everything in that book. I yeah. highly recommend that book. Yeah, he spells his name Z O L T A N, and then Z Sabo. I think it's S Z A B O. Yep, Zoltan Zabo. Yeah, and and um, do you have a book out? I have a book that's out of print. I've only written one book. I don't. I've never had time to write a second. I've been on the road so much. Uh, my book is out of print? print, but you can still find it on Amazon. Sometimes it's it's a uh, my the name of my book is Creating Luminous Watercolor Landscapes: A Four Step Process. And I actually okay, do teach awesome. you a four-step process for doing a painting in that book. But if you if you find one, you probably find a used copy somewhere. It's, uh, it went out of print about five years ago. And uh, you know, Northlight. I don't know if you all know this, but Northlight is sold. They they were yes. bought out. They were bought out by Penguin, and uh, they've just gone through all kinds of transitions. And my book is uh, has never been offered in in a in a reprint. I wish they would, because I've had so many people ask it. I knew I could sell them, but they don't. Uh, well, that's what I was going to say. Do you have it on your website? Maybe you have. Yeah, that's interesting. No, I, I don't. I wish I had some of them. I yeah. really do. I mean, I, I wish I'd have kept a whole train of them because I mean, uh, they're just uh, they're in big demand. A lot of people want them. But well, a lot of artists them. right now, as you said, because um, Northlight was sold, has gone to the uh, Walter Foster and has been doing their books through them. Yeah, but you still have to have the time to write it. That's my problem. Yeah, I've been exactly. on, I've been, I've been on yeah. the road nonstop the last uh, about the last almost twenty years. Yeah. We're just going just, I mean, when I'm not on the road teaching, I'm doing a Zoom class or I'm working, I'm writing a newsletter or I'm, I'm doing right. something. There's, there's always something to do. And it's just, uh, you know, time is of the essence more or less. And I, I just get to where I'm just bogged down with too much sometimes. This is a fun way to paint though. And what I, what I really enjoy about this is, is the fact that I can just do anything I want to this painting. And it's not going to be uh, shunned by anybody because there's nothing to compare it to. Now, if, if I did this, it's a very realistic piece. You could easily look at the photograph and say, well, you didn't do this right, didn't do that right. When you paint like this, you're just giving the viewer visual suggestions. that They, they can interpret it any way they want. And to me, that's the beauty of this is that uh, I'm just doing what I think the painting needs. And if somebody doesn't like it, that's certainly fine with me. Uh, I uh, stress over that. I don't care what you paint, everybody's not going to like it. You can have those that don't like this style, which is fine. I've run across plenty of them. But I've also run across a whole lot more that love this kind of painting. They love the, uh, the freedom of it. And that's, that's the person I'm trying to touch bases with. So we're at a point right now, uh, in a few minutes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little bit more work on these branches. I'm going to get the I'm gonna get a small rigger brush. And this, see a big negative shape right in here? We're gonna take that right now and continue that as a positive shape like this. We need some positives in here too. Now where the negative and positive come together, of course we can just blend that little junction. We might do some of that over here on this little guy too, just a little bit. So it's a negative into positive, we're positive into negative, however you want to look at it. It's kind of like you know, what came first. Still trying to keep lots of this softness. Keep that soft edge. Those, those soft edges are so pretty. Now in a few minutes, we'll get some, uh, I'll get my rigger brush out, my number my round brushes. This has all been done with flat brushes so far. But we will come in and do some, uh, some work with some round brushes in just a minute.
So in the workshop I'm doing this week, we're going to be doing some trees. We'll be doing, a, I'll probably do some kind of a, a stylized floral or something, a, a still life. I love the still lights. They're beautiful in this style. If you can take this style of painting and just you can do you can do a portrait in this style. I've seen people do it, and they're they're quite striking, and they stand out. So I'm a big uh, I'm a big stickler on doing something that really stands out and commands attention, as opposed to just painting like everybody else does. You know, as an artist, you want your work to stand out, and uh, this style will stand out. Now, I think I will get the round brush. Uh, this is my number eight. This is my number eight round, just a, just a round nylon brush. I want to put a few more of these uh, little branches and things on these trees. That's not quite dark enough. Let's make that darker. That's finally dry. Let's see if we can't get some stuff up in here. So these are just, uh, like I said, we're not looking at a photograph anymore. This is all about just whatever the painting needs, that's what we're gonna do. Photograph has done its job. I'm gonna put a few cracks on some of these rocks. Not a lot, just a few, just to uh, make them a little bit more craggy. And this sounds kind of crazy, but you have to leave a place to sign your I'm gonna sign my painting right there. So I'm not getting too busy in this corner. I do have to have a place to put a signature. Now I'm getting ready to put the really strong dark. I'm gonna put some really strong dark right in this area. This area up here, I don't think needs it. I mean, it pretty much reads the way I want it to read. It's not too busy. But here I'm putting some uh, burnt sienna and some Payne's gray, making a very, very strong dark. It's not a black, but it's close to a black. So I'm gonna come right down in these areas now where some of these roots are and really kind of, uh, not only put in a dark, but while we're at it, create another root. But there's another negative root right in the middle of that one. And so you got the, and make that area really jump out. It'll show even better when it's dry. Right now it's all kind of wet and shiny, but when it dries, it should be a very strong little statement. So these are little secondary, I call them second generation negative shapes. The first negative shape are these things like this. Now that now we're coming in underneath that and creating more negative shapes. It kind of walks the eye way back inside the, uh, the cracks and crevices of these rocks and all these little recessed areas. So it gives me a chance to put a nice rich dark which makes things kind of pop.
This is my number six rigger, my little small rigger brush. I'm gonna put some, a uh, few more cracks in these rocks. And something else I do, which I do all the time, it's just a, it's a trademark thing about a splatter. I'm taking this, uh, this number six rigger. It's got, got this kind of greenish. Uh, this is uh, actually some permanent yellow and some ultramarine. I'm just putting some splatter up in the tree. Splatter gives a painting a very nice, fresh looseness. You don't want to do too much of it, but a little bit goes a long way. I'm gonna put just a little bit of that splatter on some of these rocks down these areas. Like I said, it just gives it a very fresh and a fresh look. So now I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, what else does this piece need? It's obviously a very old tree. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of a burrow down inside the rocks. Is there, is there anything else I can do to make it more exciting or should I just back away from it? That's, that's always a $64,000 question. And there's no, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just whatever the artist feels like doing. But I've learned from experience, you're better off to, to quit while you're ahead than to keep trying to push it. So this piece is just about finished. I'll put a few more little, uh, little suggestions of something on it here, just a few more darks and things. This there, I think is dry. I'm gonna hit this with the dryer one second, then we'll put a signature right there. Then we'll put a mat on this and see how it looks. So give me one minute here. So to sign this, I'm using a number four round. That's a very tiny little brush. It's got a nice little point on it. That's nice and dry. And give me one second to move a few things and we'll put a mat on this.
And there's what we wound up with. Gorgeous. Thank you. And we had a, what comments? Love the negative painting, stunning, gorgeous. The depth you created with the color is amazing. Thank you so much. Well, it's been my pleasure. I hope you got, uh, got some good information out of this. And uh, like I said, the, the workshop this week is gonna be all about uh, doing stylized watercolors. And uh, we're gonna be doing a variety of subjects. But the main thing I'm trying to, I, I'm actually, I'm on a mission these days. I hope everybody will bear with me because I spent so many years teaching you how to paint very fine, detailed paintings. And I see, I see so many really incredible artists over the years. I've seen so many over the years of these workshops. People have a tremendous talent. They've got the paints, they got the palettes, they got the brushes, and they, and they know how to use them. But they try so hard to paint like everybody else is painting. And I, I'm, just, I'm really trying to nudge people just a little bit to do something a little bit more expressive, a little more colorful, a little bit more dynamic. Um, and I didn't realize the importance of that until I started judging these big national shows and things like that, that uh, the artist whose work is quite often different, it, it grabs the judge's attention. Your, your work just commands attention, it just jumps out. And when I started doing that, I started getting into more of these big shows and winning more awards and getting signatures and that kind of stuff. Because for years I entered shows and half the time I didn't, well, I'd say probably about 90% of the time my work was rejected. And, uh, and the ones I did get into, I wasn't winning any awards. And when I started doing the more creative pieces like this, that all changed. I started getting more awards. I started getting in more shows. So that, just, that was just a red flag, you know? Uh, so I'm on a mission nowadays to really work with artists and teach them how to, how to paint a little bit more creative than what they might otherwise paint. So th those taking the workshop this week, uh, we're going to really get in some creative stuff. I, I, I think you'll enjoy it. And I think it's going to be, a, uh, if, if you've never done that kind of work before, it, it's like anything else, it, it's, it's a learning curve. You know, we all have to paint the bad ones to get to the good ones, but that's okay. You got to start somewhere. And I, uh, the good thing about it is at the workshop, I will be available all day long to look at your work and critique your work and make suggestions. And, uh, but I really do have a personal interest in seeing artists get creative and do some dynamic work. And I'm looking forward to it. So Sterling, with that being said, people were, are a little confused. They don't know what kind of images to bring. Typically, so, yeah, that's, yeah, what I, that, that, you know, a lot of workshops, the, the instructor will send out photographs of things we're going to paint. Some workshops, they'll even send you a sketch on a piece of watercolor paper. Uh, what, what I'm telling people to do primarily is bring photographs of things you think you would like to paint. It can be anything. It can be a, a, a landscape. It can be a floral. It can be a still life because we're going to do a variety of things. And what I'm going to show you this week is, is every day I will start out with a photograph of something or, or an idea of what I want to paint. And we'll, I'm going to show you how to do some quick sketches of it and, uh, and then how to do the sketch on the watercolor paper and then how to do something very creative with it. So what, rather than having everybody just feel like they have to paint what I like, I'm saying bring things, bring photographs of things you like. And I'm going to teach you the techniques you need to go in there and paint something of that or a facsimile of that that's done in a very artistic and very creative manner. That's why uh, uh, that's, that's the reason I don't say you got to bring this and you got to bring that. I'm leaving it up to every individual to bring what they, they think they would like to paint. And I'm going to try to work with you during the week and show you a, a creative way of doing it. Okay, great. Right. Any other questions? Don't hesitate to ask. I mean, I don't know much. I don't know what our time allotment is, but uh, I'm, I'm certainly available to answer questions. And uh, I know this is a, it's a lot to take in. I know that I've been there, and I, I know what it's like when it's when you're seeing somebody do something kind of different. You're not really sure where they're going with it, but I really do uh, uh, encourage questions, and I will do the same thing during the workshop as well. How, ma how many different images do you anticipate painting in the workshop? Well, we'll do three. It's a three-day workshop, so we'll do at least three because each day I will do it. Let me tell you how the workshop's going to go. Now, some workshops, people do paint-alongs. I encourage people not to paint along because you saw how fast I had to work on that wet paper. I almost always start on wet paper, which means I've got to work super fast. That's not to impress or to show off. That's just because I want to get a few minutes to get that color on there before it dries. If you try to paint along with me while you're looking at your paper doing this, you're not seeing what I'm doing on my piece. You're missing a lot of stuff. So I encourage people to watch the entire demonstration and then they can paint whatever they want to paint using some of the techniques they learn in that demonstration. 
So uh, I'll do at least three full sheet paintings during the week. Each morning will be a full sheet piece. We'll start out with a very brief discussion and then I will do a complete full sheet painting. It'll be done in, in uh, about the same time I took to paint this. And it's not gonna take your whole day up. You'll have plenty of time to paint in the afternoon. And um, like I said, you can paint whatever you want, but each day will be a different subject. One day we're definitely doing a still life, which is wine glasses and wine bottles and things like that. One day we're probably doing something with trees may not be these kind of trees, but there'll be something with trees. And I think we might also, we, I'll, I'll kind of put to a vote to see if the crowd is interested. We, we could do a big full sheet, very stylized floral. Those are very popular pieces because it really gives you a chance to learn all the negative, how to uh, really play with color and just do something very dynamic. So we'll, uh, we'll kind of play it by air and see what, see what the mood of the class is. That sound good? Yes, I have a question. Sure. I have a question about the floral. Mm -hmm. um, Will it be like a bouquet of flowers or will it be like say three hibiscus in the bush? Let me show you, if you got one second, okay. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you one here that I just, I, I, uh, I'm doing a series of videos for, a, for an art academy in St. Petersburg, Russia. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a video course that they're doing on uh, stylized and abstract paintings. And this is one of the pieces I just filmed for that group. It's a very stylized floral. Oh, got a color. Okay. The color on that is not what what you're seeing is not nearly as attractive as the colors in this, but it's but it gives you an idea. See, it's very. We, I don't even know what kind of flower it is. It doesn't really matter what kind of flower it is. It's just a flower. It's a floral. It's, it's something botanical, and you see all the negatives and all that kind of stuff. So this is a uh, this is symbolic of how I typically do my florals, and this started on wet paper just like today's piece did. But the, the beauty of learning this, and, and I'm not even trying to sell it, it, it it's, just, it's just a fact. When you can do a, a full sheet painting in, in a couple of hours, um, that's just a, that's a blessing. As a, I used to spend months on a full sheet painting. And this, this piece, uh, this, this, can, can y'all hear me okay? My computer's making noises. Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay, fine. Uh, this entire piece, even stopping to explain things as I went, took about two hours to paint. And uh, the, the pieces I have in galleries, most of them take anywhere from an hour and a half to maybe two and a half hours maximum to paint, but in this very stylized manner. And there's there's paintings of buildings and you name it, it's all it's all there. So I, that's why um, I'm really just so so sold on this, this process. When I reached over to get this painting up. I don't know if I pulled a cord or what, but it's making all kinds of weird noises. Uh, any other questions? Um, hi, this is Jane. I have a quick question. At the beginning, when you were describing your stylized, uh, loose, semi-abstract, you mentioned that you do complement of opposites. Can you point out on this finished uh, piece where you have examples of that complement of opposites. Absolutely. You see, you got the nice light, then you have very strong darks. You got very bright whites, very dark darks. And here you got a lot of warm colors. Here you got some cool colors. You got positive shapes. You got negative shapes. You got soft edges. You got hard edges. See, everything in that painting is complemented at least somewhere in that painting by its opposite. And uh, I, I call that I call that my rule of opposite. It's not written in stone, and it's just a term I put on it. But what I found is, if you if you if you try to have compliments in your paintings, it, it's amazing the difference it makes. And a good example here: I got these all this greenery. I put some red in there. That's just a little bit of quinacridone scarlet, just a touch of red in a few places to kind of complement the greens we have. They turn into a nice neutral gray, which is good. I didn't want a bright red, but just those little pops of red in there are pretty complement all the greens. So I, I really do make it a conscious effort to uh, whatever I do in that painting, somewhere there's going to be a compliment. If I leave a lot of soft edges like I did in here, all these areas, I'm going to put in some nice hard edges to balance that. And that's, uh, and the viewer sometimes will not even see it. Uh, unless you've got a, a really trained eye to know what the artist, what he or she did, you might not even notice that. But what you notice is a painting just seems, it just, everything just kind of morphs into a painting. They all just kind of work together. Thank you for going through and showing us that. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Does anybody else have any questions they'd like to ask? Um, 
Go ahead, yeah. Sandy. Yeah, I was wondering, it's off topic, but as a member of Whiskey Painters, did you know Chris Van Winkle? Who was it? Chris Van Winkle. No, I didn't. I, I've, I've heard of him, but I didn't know him. I've, I've, been, I've been a member since 2016. Oh, I uh, see. Yeah, yeah it's, you came uh, in after him. Yeah, I, I must. I Maybe you took his place. No, I know the guy whose place I took. Unfortunately, it's a fellow that I knew. I knew, and uh, I, I was very, I, I really didn't want the space at his expense. For those that don't know, whiskey paintings, only had, there's only 150 of us in the world. Yeah. It's, it's international. It's men and women. There's only 150 spots in the entire world, and you have to be juried into it. So it's quite a process, and which means that unless somebody dies, there are no openings. Anytime there's an opening, it means somebody in the group has passed away. And uh, now that's the bad thing about being a whiskey painter. Everybody wants to know what kind of health you're in right now. People say, how are you feeling? Are you doing okay? You know, so yeah. I've never had so many people in my life interested in my health as, as I have since I became a whiskey painter, but <clears throat> just joking. But, you know, it's just, uh, it's a rather unique group. It's a very unique group. I, I'm very honored to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just curious. Sure. Sterling, someone did ask what the name of the book again was that you referred to with <clears throat> the negative painting. Yeah, well, this it's a book that I wrote. It's called, uh, it's called Creating Luminous watercolor landscapes creating creating luminous watercolor landscapes a four-step process now if you go to amazon just type in sterling edwards if that book's out there you'll see it okay. uh, sometimes you find them on ebay uh, there's a lot of uh, used ones floating around but the uh <clears throat> there is they went out of print about again about five years ago probably And then Sue asked, what tool do, um, do you use to soften your strokes, like the shadows? I use, uh, this, that's, that's another little brush I designed. All these, these bristle brushes are brushes I personally designed. Uh, I designed all three of those. There's a two inch, a one inch, and an inch and a half. These are, these are hog bristles. They're very stiff. And the thing about a stiff bristle brush is I can take like this one inch bristle brush here. And I, it, I have it barely damp. It's, it's wet and I squeeze most of the water out of it. So it's barely damp to the touch, which means I can lay some color down and I can take this brush and soften an edge without putting water on the painting. Most of the time, most of the time when, you, when you do watercolors, you, you, you put down some color and if you want to lose an edge, you take a really wet brush to soften that edge. And quite often you wind up with a blossom. This brush will not give you blossoms. It's just, it's just wet enough to lose that edge, but it's not putting water on the painting. And that's, that's the beauty of a bristle brush. You can, you can just move that paint so quickly and easily without uh, putting water on the piece and, and risking the blossoms. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, well, well I guess I'm that wraps it up. Well, the the um, workshop starts tomorrow at 10 a.m. So Sterling, I'll meet you here a little bit early. Okay. And if anybody wants to sign mm -hmm. up, you can still do it. It's not too late. Go ahead and register when after you're done here and uh, uh sterling thanks again for today it was a fantastic demo gorgeous painting well thank you i appreciate it i'm looking forward to the next three days we're gonna have a good time <laughs> thank Very you yeah thank you thank you all right bye sterling and and say uh thanks to your wife too she yeah. <laughs> she helped out oh i will definitely tell her that for sure <laughs> thank you <laughs> We'll Thank see. you. All right. We will see you tomorrow then. All right. Good night. Good Bye -bye. night. Bye, everybody. Thank you for coming.